All right, today is when, or Tuesday, September 22nd, 2015, and we are interviewing Dale Hunter at the Illinois State Library. My name is Sue Burkholder, and I will be the interviewer. Dale, for the um, recording, could you please tell us what branch of service you served? Army. Okay. All right. And how about if you we start with you telling us just a little bit about yourself? Well, I just turned 90. Uh, my last time in service was in 1946. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time in combat in Europe, going in in Marseille, and when the war was over, I came out in Munich. So I saw an awful lot of Europe. Uh, some pleasant times and some bad times. I think the big thing is the human mind is a wonderful thing. You remember the times that were funny, the times that were easy. All the bad things that happened, you put on the back burner and the brain just automatically tries to push them out of the road. Thank goodness for that. Um, as far as my belief in veterans, there is no difference in veterans. We are all just that, veterans. We have faced the enemy. We Some survived, some didn't. But whatever our rank meant nothing when it comes to being a veteran. We all faced it. There are no special individuals. We hold the, the feeling between all veterans is the same. Uh, too much emphasis is put on a lot of people wearing, for instance, fatigues. If they've been out of service for 20 years, they still wear fatigues as though they were in service. And then a lot of reactivators want to wear the uniform it's much simpler and much more sensible that they serve if they want to play soldier. Um, I, I, I have no, no use for ponies. Um, I'd like to ask you before we um, go on with what would uh, we would normally go through, um, today was a very special day, um, is the Veterans History Project here at the Illinois State Library, and could you just just for a moment, tell us a little bit about um, the honor that you received today. It was a most unexpected honor. I worked with some wonderful French people. General Leclerc was one of them. Um, I traveled from Marseille clear up to Reims to back up the Northern Front, and Anvil softened the Northern Front, and I was foolish enough to volunteer, which one doesn't do, but uh, we took equipment up and then returned to Marseille and Aix de Provence and got our own unit and then uh, the Italian campaign had weakened and we moved forward. Okay. And you um, actually, the um, deputy consulate, I believe, from the um, from Chicago of the French was here today to pin your, as we can see in the video, your um, medal of, uh, French Medal of Honor. That's pretty outstanding. Yeah. yeah. That's something else. Just a week ago, we saw where three gentlemen, military people, had received the Medal of Honor uh, for getting some renegade off the train and so on. And then to have it happen to you, just a week later, it's pretty phenomenal. And they're marvelous people, marvelous people. Yes, very good. Well, um, I'm gonna backpedal just a little bit. Could you just tell us where you were born and maybe a little bit about your family before you went into the Army? I was born in Lincoln, Illinois. Came to Springfield when I was in the first grade or some such thing, and uh, have lived basically in Springfield ever since. We, um, about 10, we moved to a farm, which is a different experience altogether. Um, you go to a one-room school in the country, and you're that city slicker, so you're on the outside. Then when you move back to town, you're that country bumpkin, and you're going to get nailed and 
it's not going to be too pleasant for a little while. So it's, it's part of the experience, and the experience is learning experience. Everything you do, uh, you, you, every experience you learn is something you use down the line. Uh, what you do today affects what you do tomorrow. And uh, those accumulated beliefs uh, show up in life as you go. Um, when you left for the service, what family did you leave behind, and, and how did they feel about you leaving? I had one brother who was already was in service, and uh, comparing the two of us, he was that old timer. You knew by his appearance he was a pro, and pictures of us together, you could see I was a green kid, and. Uh, left behind were my mother and father, and uh, my dad at that time was working at Dallas Chalmers in a war plant building blitz buggies. Uh, little did I realize that when I got into Europe, I'd see some of those blitz buggies in action. And uh, some were good and some weren't, but um, they were very unhappy to see me go, but I was, I was eager. I was eager as could be. When I went in, I, my whole hope was to get in aviation. That's the only thing that I really was familiar with. And after the interviews and so on in Chicago at Great Lakes, no, it wasn't Great Lakes, it was the Fort Sheridan, um, they said, uh, Soldier, you remember that room back there where everybody had their hand up and you swore to this? I said, I didn't say a word. He said, Soldier, you can't see well enough to be in the Air Force. I said, all right, so a ground job, Air Force. No. Nope. He said, you pick better. I said, well, I'll go home. And he said, enough of this foolishness. You're in the military. And uh, so the next thing I knew, I was cavalry. And uh, began a new set of learning. And... Uh, I was sent to special crew schools on weapons up at Aberdeen Proving Ground, which actually uh, made my understanding of the military complete. Uh, the first night up there, I was chewed out royally by the unit commanding officer, and it was in the day room. The day room, I always thought, was where you relaxed. Well, so I relaxed. I undid my tie and took off my coat. I was listening to radio and whatnot. And the commander came down and uh, decided to have a meeting. And it was his prerogative to select somebody to make a goat out of. And I was his man. He let everybody know who was in charge and how tough things were going to be. But that's the same man that months later, when I was in the hospital, brought me cigarettes and candy and then gave me a, a, a leave to come home. So he, he did his job well. But it was that learning experience, what to expect. I know my first night in service, I was so proud of that uniform, I couldn't get it on fast enough. And I heard there was a dance someplace close. So I decided to go. I didn't dance, but I wanted to show up that uniform. And it's dark at night, no street lights or anything in the post. I hear three fellows coming towards me, walking down the street. And I thought, well, listen, I got a cigarette. I haven't got a match, but I got a cigarette. So as they get closer, I said, buddy, have you got a, got a match? And he did. He struck the match, and all I saw was polished brass. First time I'd ever seen a general officer. And I dropped the cigarette and tried to salute, and I didn't know anything about anything. But uh, that was my first experience. And then uh, the next day they told us to horse the barracks. Well, uh, horse the barracks, that's a good idea. Couldn't find any water, but we found some mops in the corner of the barracks. On the corner of each barracks was a container, which I thought was water. 
It wasn't. It was uh, what you'd fight a fire with, not water. That floor may not be dry yet today, but we, we washed it. But that was my first experiences in service. Um, after you, well, after that, um, do you feel like you were then starting to adapt? And, and how did you adapt, I guess, is what I want to ask, um, as more things came along? Well, being sent to school was away from the unit. And we were sent to Aberdeen with permanent stone barracks, everything the show place of the whole army. And uh, I wound up in the hospital. The gun exploded. And I wound up in the hospital. And uh, through the hospital, I met some of the ladies from the WAC detachment. And so I recognized a dumb kid. They, they knew who. They would take me into Washington, D.C. with them on weekends to see some of the girls that were at Walter Reed. So I got to know them pretty well. And uh, they broke down that loneliness that you might get in your first days in service. Um, now, when I was in the hospital, uh, just sitting around for ages doesn't do anything. So this same officer talked me into taking other subjects other than just weaponry. Um, I, I took bomb disposal. That's one most people would stay away from, but to me it was intricate, it was interesting. Um, I remember we had uh, booby traps. I thought that was just a great subject, but it was also something I thought we were going to run into in combat. And nobody, very, very few people, probably one out of a thousand persons, got into that bomb disposal area. But now, also I had some other time he thought an aircraft armament would let me at least be close to an airplane. And so aircraft armament, it was still weaponry. So it gave me an expanse of what was, what was happening there. So all in all, my experience in the, in the school was fine. Then when I went back to the unit, I heard they were going to Europe. And they couldn't go without me. Boy, they couldn't. How dumb I was. But anyway, I, I got back to the unit. We turned right around and went back up to Camp Kilmer in New Jersey to POE'd out to Europe. Not knowing where, uh, it's, it's ironic. My brother was at Camp Kilmer in New Jersey in service. He went to England. I went to North Africa. Went from there over to Marseille. And uh, when the war ended, he was in Pilsen, Czechoslovakia, and I was in Munich. And you can pretty much fit that part. But I didn't know anything about it. But uh, it was interesting. Uh, we, in southern France, as I say, we volunteered to go north to back up the uh, invasion of northern France. And it was, it was very interesting. We, after the first excursion up there, we felt as though we knew something about the area. So when the whole unit moved north, we, we got, it, it's hard to remember. You can know you went to Strasbourg, Saarburg, Sargermanes, and those aren't close together. How you got from one place to another, uh, I don't recall the actual activities, but uh, finally got up there and then, uh, I remember there was a place called Triple Work, which is a manufacturing facility. When we moved in, all of the metalworking machinery, great heavy industry, was all unbolted from the floors. And there were big tags on it, shipped to USSR. So evidently the engineers or somebody had got there first and had orders to move this equipment to Russia. 
and that's how they got some of their big industry. Um, this triple work, I think, was one where our unit uh, wanted to stay undercover, so they found a building. And even if it was for a day or two, you were inside. And some of the fellows went in, set up their bunks, immediately left. They had heard some ticking in the walls. So somebody got the idea that bomb disposal hunter can do it. So I went in, trench knife and whatnot. I listened for a long time. It was ticking. I could understand why nobody wanted to stay in the building. But I cut a hole in the wall. We finally got to the problem. It was nothing but rain. It had rained and was dripping in between the two buildings. The guys still wouldn't stay in the building. They, they were gun shy. But uh, most, most fellas that went to Europe stayed with a specific unit. Uh, I was on detached service to here and to there and someplace else constantly. If somebody needed something, it seemed like I was the loose cannon that was sent. Uh, I can remember one time driving a, I think it was 37 ton prime mover, which is a huge, huge truck used for pulling a tank back from the line. I don't know how I got the job of driving it. I didn't know anything more than anybody else. But I'm driving down the road on this with this thing, and the GI soap that was laying on the seat rolled over. It wasn't GI soap, it was TNT. And all you had to do was screw a little primer into that thing, and it would explode. Break the primer and it would explode. As soon as I saw that, I pulled over and stopped. And there was a glow compartment above the windshield on these big things. And I pulled out all the fuses, box after box after box of fuses. Once you explode one of them, the whole thing would have gone. So I got out of that real quick. But uh, there, were, there were a lot of mistakes made in World War II. Uh, speaking of prime movers, this is a big, expensive piece of equipment. One area where we were at, there were five of them. One fellow thought he had winterized it, drained the water out of it. Another guy thought he had, and nobody had. And which required the inspector general coming down because of three engines completely ruined. And we needed all the equipment we could get. Errors. We, we moved over to Severn Pass, which was one of the battles areas, and we would lay out air markers so the aircraft in the area would know who was friendly and who wasn't. And we had a P-47 outfit that evidently didn't like us or something. They would come down and strafe the panels. And we'd communicate, communicate, and they didn't do a bit of good. And we had a later episode with P-47 people later in the war. Um, the association with other branches of service, um, foreign countries and so on, was good. I worked with General Leclerc quite a bit, whose vehicles all had the Cross of Lorraine painted on them. And uh, he was a delightful man, a uh, lot of sense, and didn't make waves, but he did a good job. And uh, I even traded uniforms with some of the French. They had a, a sheepskin lining that they used underneath their field jackets that was warmer than ours. But uh, speaking of clothes, not everybody had shoe packs in Europe. Uh, a few had them. And if you didn't have them, you were keeping your feet warm and dry with something else. And uh, I found out quickly that uh, when you didn't have shoe packs, you looked for somebody on a stretcher that didn't need shoe packs. And that's how I got my first ones. And the guy was glad to give them up. But you put on the back burner all the bad things. Um, 
when I got hit, it was, uh, we shouldn't have tried to take the position with as few people as we did. Uh, but everything was basically on some sort of timetable. Crossing the Rhine, for instance, you were given these these dumb little boats with two befores on them to cross the Rhine on. And they're floating around. It was years afterwards that I wasn't afraid to go over a bridge. But when I came home, I, I was afraid of bridges, and the calluses on my feet lasted for seven years after I got home. That was from the walk from Marseille up to what was German CB2. And uh, we went from high tension wires, followed them. And they had told us in service that uh, at night, take off your shoes, change socks, keep moisture off your body as best you can. And we didn't do any of those. We laid down the first place we could find and it was a hillside full of rocks. We didn't find that out till the next morning, but there were a bunch of cold characters. But, uh, and then we found out on that trek north that the mattress covers we were carrying were not specifically for mattress covers. They were for body bags and uh, everybody threw away some of their equipment. Uh, you learned what was really essential and what wasn't. Uh, our gas mask, for instance, we used the hose to cut the rings of rubber off, put around our dog tags so that they wouldn't rattle. And uh, uh, little sounds you were cognizant of. Um, it's, it's like one thing that scared me was the M1. When you fired the last round, that metallic, metallic sound of the, the metal thing that held your cartridges flipped out all by itself. And it was like ringing a bell. So I elected to use submachine gun and, uh, and an old 1903 rifle. Everybody thought it was for strictly for snipers, but it wasn't. It worked. But uh, um. when we when we wound up in Munich, uh, I getting down there. I had been in a hospital over there at 95th General Hospital, Bardaju. They pulled me back when I got hit. And I met some wonderful people in the hospital, but also some strange dudes. We had one man who sat cross-legged in his bed all day long, shuffling cards, uniform, in uniform. And I wasn't until later I found out he had shrapnel in his spine and nobody could touch it. Uh, whenever you saw somebody in the hospital with their head bandaged completely, you knew he was a tanker and he had been fired inside of a tank. Um, one fellow I particularly remember in the hospital, he was due to be released. And he had been issued all new equipment. He came over to say goodbye. And he lingered around hour after hour, saying goodbye over and over. It was evident he didn't want to go back to the line. Finally, I guess it got the best of him. He picked up a metal bed, stuck out his leg, and when he let go with the bed, it peeled his shin right down to the ball. It wasn't battle fatigue, he was just plain scared like everybody else. Uh, they had a marvelous thing at the hospital. If you asked for a pass to go out, it was time for you to be discharged. Uh, I remember the day Roosevelt died, um, in the hospital compound, fenced around the thing. The staff went out to play baseball in the open space next to the hospital. So they opened the gates. We went out to watch, watch him play baseball. We got further and further and further out in the outfield. And my goodness, town was just a little ways off. So John and I uh, 
we decided to not ignore the president's passing, but we would visit the town of Barley Duke. I, it was a quite a place in World War One. It was an air base there, but uh, we went in town in robes and boots. It's not quite the uniform they would have expected, but the whole town was draped in black. And uh, so we nibbled a couple. And when we came back, this little ravine that we had gone over, uh, all there were were stones that you could hop across. And in a pair of combat boots and a robe, you don't hop so good. So I skinned up a toe and such foolishness. Then we got back to the compound and it was all locked up. So we clumb a drain pipe on the outside of the building to get back in. Um, that's not done by protocol. Um, now, when you actually left the hospital, you were sent to a replacement depot. But this particular one was sent back to Worms, Germany. And from there, you would be dispatched out to various units. So you had no idea what unit you would be sent or serving with, or if you knew anybody, or even your type of unit. So I'm sent back. And the first day there, I recognized a fellow that had been next to us when I was stationed in Georgia. Our unit was very close to theirs. And I said, do you know where Willie is? Willie was my right arm. Spoke German, you couldn't lose him. He was like a built-in compass. And he said, I don't know, but I'll see what I can find out. Two days later, Willie picked me up. Now, a normal procedure, they put your name up on the bulletin board and they tell what time and what your transportation is going to be. Not the unit you're going to, but when they're going to pick you up. I didn't want to be picked up. So Willie came and picked me up, took me back to the unit, and uh, the best friend I ever had. Um, it was uncanny when we were driving someplace. He had never known where it was, but with a fluent German, we got by fine. But there were there were rough times <clears throat> that I can recall in some instances. One one town, we German town, we stopped outside the town and asked if the German were the army was still there, and they said, "Oh no, they've all gone. They've all gone." Well. We went a block further and turned the corner and ran into nothing but artillery, field pieces from German. So we lost two tanks immediately. In retaliation, we stuck the barrel of a tank down the basement at some of these houses, and we obliterated the house real quick. So they lied to us, but they paid the price. Um, when I got hit, I was extremely lucky. Um, I'd been cutting barbed wire to get over this area, release these people in this concentrated food factory. And when I got through cutting the wire, I went to separate it and I stood up. And when I stood up, here's a guy with a submachine gun pointed right at me. I could have smelled his breath, we were so close. And he got just one shot off. And I don't know whether it blew the legs out from under me or whether I had sense enough to hit the ground real quick. But he only got one shot in me. But I tried to stay with my unit as long as I could. So I walked with a cane and a rifle for about 10 days. And finally, that left knee was about the size of a pretty near the size of a small watermelon today. And it had turned purple and didn't smell too good. So I went over to 4th Division and that was a close unit. And uh, they, they cleaned the thing up, took bone fragments out, 
decided to fly me back. So they put me on an evacuation field, evac hospital, flew me back to Barley Duke. Uh, when I first got hit, I didn't know where there was a medical unit. And we ran across one, the fellows that were with me, and I found one that had just got to Europe. They hadn't even unpacked their equipment, a whole medical unit. And they were doing what they called acclimatizing these people. They were having to stand out in an open field and just get cold and tired and nothing, accomplishing nothing but waiting for all their equipment to be opened and set up the buildings, the tents and whatnot. So this bird colonel comes over. They told him I'd been wounded. The first thing he does is take a cardboard Thing with a string on it and write battle casualty on it and tied it into my buttonhole. Well, what in the world else did he think I would be but a battle casualty? And then he wanted to cut off my pants. Well, I only had one pair of pants and I didn't like the idea of them being cut off. And, uh, and then he wanted to put a huge bandage on it. He picked out what he could of the bone and the fragments and whatnot and uh, he put this big bandage on the thing. I said, people are going to think something's wrong. He said, there is something wrong. But anyway, uh, I thought it was a strange way for medicals to act. All the rest of the unit stood around and watched like it was a theater or something. And I looked like a dummy. But uh, Force Division, they, they, in Barley Duke, they treated it with hot, hot salt water just as hot as you could stand. And it healed from the inside out, and they did a marvelous job. My, my Purple Heart was issued in the hospital. Uh, it was funny, when I first went in the hospital, I woke up to white sheets and white navy blankets. And momentarily, I thought I'd died. I thought, this, this must be the hereafter. But it wasn't. But when I was issued a Purple Heart, I went to the John. And when I got back, the Purple Heart was laying on my bed. And I said, I asked the nurse, I said, what am I supposed to do with this? I mean, I can't put this in my pocket and carry it around. And she said, give me your mother's address and so on, and I'll take care of it. And they did. They, they did a very good job in the hospital. And uh, when I got out, Willie, Willie met me and took care of me. And... Uh, we went on down to Landsberg, Augsburg, Nuremberg, and then on to Munich. I saw von Goering, von Rundstadt. They were in, in prison on the way down there. And Goering looked like somebody, a balloon that somebody let the air out of. He wasn't his classy self, but uh, went on down. We saw Dachau, and uh, we made some mistakes there. We, we fed prisoners that their constitution didn't, wouldn't accept food. Um, and then after Munich, uh, the war supposedly was stopping. Uh, that first night after cessation of hostilities was to take place. There was more gunfire than during the war. Uh, I don't know whether they were scared or they were celebrating or what, but it was manhandled. But... Uh, and that's where you were at the end of the war? Yeah. We visited Birch's Garden and uh, it's an unusual place. Uh, you had to go through trees and bushes to get to the elevators that took you up to this thing. Uh, I can see why Hitler didn't care for it. It was uh, a long elevator ride up. And when you looked out on the veranda of the place, uh, if you fell off the veranda, you'd file, fall a couple of miles. <laughs> uh, I guess that's where they held all their 
meetings and so on. There were a lot of GIs there. Uh, the early guys were collecting silverware and souvenirs and all kind of junk. Um, I was more interested in saving my skin than souvenirs. But uh, in Munich, I met uh, a gentleman who had taught English in the German schools before Hitler. And I met him and his family, and uh, they were very nice people. Uh, one night when I was visiting these people, I came down the railroad track and led into the back of Dornier Aircraft Factory, which is where we were building. And as I came down the tracks, it was dark, but I heard somebody behind me on the railroad tracks. And the faster I walked, the faster they walked. And I got to a run, and they were running. And he got close enough I could see he had an axe in his hand. And what he was was a, I run like the devil. He scooted under the fence at Tornier to get inside. Um, he was a Russian, displaced person, who wanted my uniform. With his uniform, he could go and rob all the homes he wanted to, blame it on the Americans. Um, I haven't said too much about the shooting, but as I mentioned before, the mind puts the bad stuff on the back burner. Um, I, I, I have so many profound feelings about this veterans thing. Um, all of us have faced our maker so many times. We're all the same. Rank means absolutely nothing. It's in your heart that you have faced the master. Uh, it, it's far better to have known very little than to give a false belief in, in the service served. It, it's, uh, you can't see it. My brother, <clears throat> who I said was in service part before me. He never joined too many veterans organizations. He didn't really act to like, like to tell people he was a veteran. Uh, because of his own belief, he believed in himself and what he could do for himself and humanity. And uh, he was sure a good example for me. Um, in the immediate days and weeks, um, after the end of the war, um, how well? How long were you in after the end of the war? When did your service end then? Ended in January of ninety six of twenty. Uh, January of forty six. Ended in January of forty six. In the meantime, after coming back to the states, uh, I wound up in a hospital again. I seem to have done that an awful lot, but. Uh, after that, I was assigned to Fort Leonard Wood in order to report to the commanding general down there. And I didn't know what I'd done wrong. I knew I must have done something wrong. But he tells me when I get there that I'm assigned to a unit that's going to start an ordnance school. And I wasn't assigned to the thing. I was in charge of the damn thing. So the next thing I'm he said, pick out any people you want, wherever they're at, and they'll be your staff. So I ordered equipment, ordered a six by six and a sedan, and we headed for Texarkana, Texas, pick up training aids, rifles, that sort of thing. But uh, the Army had uh, some good technical schools. Uh, I know when I was up at Aberdeen, I wound up teaching up there. And they had the finest equipment in the building that I've ever seen for teaching you weapons. Uh, every In the final test was you took every weapon that was available. It was set up to misfire. And you had, right in front of God and everybody, behind this glass, you were to correct the thing and make it fire properly. And you actually fired the weapon uh, it, it was marvelous. 
we had students down there from Marine Corps, from the Navy, Coast Guard, the whole nine yards. And I was teaching at that time uh, machine guns. And it was without, you knew it was going to happen in every class. Somebody was going to put a firing pin through the ceiling. There's a lot of tension on it. And that scares the hell out of everybody. Because that thing could go through you and forget about it. And uh, some of these fellows from the other services, uh, they would party all night and sleep all day in class. And you knew you were going to have some problems. But uh, I remember a, a lot of funny incidents. <clears throat> one, uh, one guy that was supposed to be a high-ranking officer, we pulled retreat one night. And he walks away from the retreat practicing fast draw with his pistol. And I thought, if there is a big kid in this crowd that belongs at home playing with a doll, this guy belongs there. But um, we, we made a lot of mistakes in Europe. But uh, we learned from Yankee, Indian, Yankee ingenuity served us well whether it was a flail tank or how to get through hedgerows. Uh, we had one of the greatest weapons that the Germans had was what was called a Panzerfaust. It looked like a broomstick. And every GI in German had one tucked underneath his arm. But all he had to do is squeeze that thing and go right through the turret of a tank. And we had some problems. We didn't have tanks that would take that. So we put gas cans, water cans. We tried putting logs around the turret. And the only thing we found that worked was plain old chicken wire. It would explode, out, explode outside the turret and wouldn't go through. And uh, not too many people mention a panzer force, but I sure got respect for it. I know one time, <clears throat> everybody should learn how to use every weapon there is. Um, for instance, a mortar it can be thrown a shell across your own troops. It can be thrown across a building that's in your road. One time, Willie and I ran across a tank that was knocked out and the crew was pinned down. They couldn't go any place. And here was a gun in place just sitting there waiting for them. Well, they couldn't get out of the thing. So I'd never, I'd seen a mortar, never used one. And on the weapon, there's so many clicks, means so much distance. We didn't know what that distance was. If you rolled it up high, it went close to you. If you laid it out angular, it went a long distance. So we had to get these guys out of there. And the first round went, must have gone 20 miles. It was a long way away, so we rolled the clicks back and it pretty near came to our feet. So in between, we got to, got to knowing how to play with this thing. And we got the emplacement out of there. But, uh, and it, uh, you remember little spotty things. This, uh, of course, concentrated food factory where all these people were. <coughs> they lived in barracks. I remember whether they were too high or three high. But there would be a family, a man and his wife and his kids all in the same place. And the night after we liberated them, there was chicken on every stove in that place. Where they got the chicken, I don't know, but they got chicken. Ingenuity on their part. Hmm. Well, you talked a little bit about when the war ended and you came back. So what about when you... Um, did you, how long did you serve in the military and like when did you retire from military? I got out in, in, in 46. 46. I went in, and papers were in in 43. Um, as soon as I could get in. Mm -hmm. Dumb kid, you know. But uh, I was expecting Air Force and it just didn't work. It was kind of ironic. When I was in high school, principal called me in one day 
Medina boy is right behind him, and I thought, really, I'd done something real wrong. And as we walked down the hall, the football coach, he got in line. He was assistant dean. We all get in the principal's office, and I thought, I'd really done something bad. And he told me that uh, they had received an order from the Navy Department to build scale model airplanes that would use for identification purposes with Air Force and artillery. Little did I know, I was put in charge of this silly thing because I had built and entered a lot of aviation things. And when I got in Georgia, here is Hunter Field, and they had me teaching airplane identification with the same stupid airplanes. So it was just for a very short period of time, but it seemed like that was my, my career. It was with this outfit, and that outfit, and another outfit, constantly. Uh, I remember when the breakthrough came with St. V, uh, we were with the British for a while. I was with Patton for two weeks. Uh, everybody was screwed up. From St. V, that's where the ball started. And that night, we were told to advance. Twenty minutes later, we were told to retreat. And it was that way all night long. Advance and retreat. Nobody really knew how much strength the Germans had. And so when we got back there, we went south towards Bastogne. And I finally wound up, we went clear far as back as Luxembourg City. And uh, we, we didn't write too much in the history books. I think they said the 106th Division and the 117th Cavalry were routed. Uh, that's not very good, but... Uh, well, since the end of the war, and uh, when you came back, uh, what career path did you take and what, what did you do? I went back to flying. That was the one thing that I knew. And uh, I worked for a gentleman who is a true aviation pioneer. And uh, I was working for them and being paid to fly all at the same time. So that's, uh, that's pretty doggone good. It's the only job I ever had. I was eager to go to work. And, uh, and I found out that I was a pretty good pilot. I used one of our heavy airplanes, went out one day, was doing aerobatics with the thing. And I was quite south of the field. And I pulled up in the master rod and the engine broke. Normally when that happens, you throw the engine. You don't, you don't fly, you, you do like a leap and you hit the ground hard. But anyway, I decided that uh, it was a long way from the field. If I, could, if I could glide that thing over to the highway, I could pick up a ride to get back to the field. And as I got closer to that highway, I thought, maybe I can make it to the field. And when I got just south of the field, I was over telephone wires and under high tension wires. And I pulled up on the ramp without any worry of runways or anything else. And I mushed it in, landed, and everybody came out, what are you, what, what's going on? And the mechanic came down and turned the propeller seven blades at seven half turns, and it locked up. If it had done that at any time, that would have been the end of it. But I figured out, I, I, at that, I was, I was a pretty good pilot. I wasn't the dummy I thought I was. <laughs> but... Um, well, um, just a couple more questions. <clears throat> what, what, um, what is the most uh, pre uh, prevalent life lesson that you've learned from your time in the mil military? Don't just talk a good war. Live it. Don't let Joe do the work. If you're going to be there, do the job. Somehow, I don't know how it is, 
but you get the Constitution to do anything. If you just put your hands in the Lord, uh, he going to help you. Um, I know that's the only thing to save my skin so many times. We talked the other night. There were 16 times that I should have been dead. 16 times, civilian life, military, aviation, the whole nine yards. Uh, somebody's really looking out for us. So I haven't done too bad. I've been in so many activities, tried so many things, and most of them have been successful. I taught for the state for 43 years and uh, at a free, free, Department of Natural Resources and the United States Power Squad is. And uh, you know inside you that you did something worthwhile for humanity. Um, so you can sit back at 90 and say, well, if I drop dead tomorrow, I haven't done too bad. Well, one more question today. What message would you like to leave for future generations who will see and or view this um, view or hear this interview? Don't afraid be afraid to do the best you can do using your own self as a gauge. You have to live with yourself. What other people say and think isn't near as important as what you have to live with yourself. Thank you. Well, Mr. Hunter, thank you so much for agreeing to this interview, and thank you from the bottom of my heart for your service. I've gone a long way here, and a long way around, and missed a lot of points. They're probably cognizant, but they're the first thing that come to mind. Um, you get philosophical as hell with old age. Um, but when you honestly believe in your ideas, uh, it's right back to that you got to live with yourself. And uh, I hope I've helped a lot of people. Uh, I've certainly done a lot of things. Uh, some of the most menial tasks you can ever expect. But uh, they've all been a learning experience. Well, very good. Thank you so much again. I hope it's done the trick. I believe so. Thank you.